thank you everyone for coming back to uh, Steve's Russick's uh, story and, and his family of surviving um, Holocaust, um, both his mother and his father. You're listening to the Obligation of Memory podcast network for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group. I'm Jeffrey Geisner, founder, and I'm interviewing Stephen um, and Steve, I want to now take you, uh, we have learned about your mom, very, uh, very emotional and emotive uh, discussion. We'll work your father uh, uh, story into this next part, but I'm going to say, as you mentioned, that you have three siblings, you have two sisters, two, a brother and a sister along yeah. with yourself. You are, you know, I wanted to ask you, growing up in two survivors' homes, how did that transfer to you? What were some of the impressions that you walked away from your parents? Maybe your mother has a different feeling for you than your father. And how would you, if your, if your siblings were there next to you, how would you feel they would answer that question as well? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, I, I think the best way to describe it is that, you know, my, my parents emigrated um, to the U.S. and we ended up. They ended up in New York City. And when was which, that? Uh, they came in uh, in uh, March of '49. And they had already been married in the camp, right? Or in the uh, ghetto? In the ghetto. They, they no uh, no actually uh, uh, in this particular instance, as it was other parts of the story. Uh, my mother's first husband um, had been murdered in in Birkenau, hmm. and. Um, and uh, my mother, uh, my mother was um, when she was liberated uh, with a bunch of girl, women from Grudno. Uh, making a long story short, they uh, they decided to uh, try to go back to Grudno, and they never got there. And uh, along the way, they were taken in by the, a Soviet, a moving Soviet camp, cap taking on. Uh, uh, individuals if you will poles and the like and taking them uh taking them into the soviet union some of them ending up in uh, you know in eastern soviet union and um and uh when my parents were when my mother and the women were picked up they had already uh, been with the americans for a little while so they put on some weight and they had a number on their arm and they had their hair grown and of course the soviets said they were collaborators right and so they're they're dealing with that for a long while, and then eventually, they're uh, they're they're just outside the town of Kovel, and on a Friday night, my mother and the women uh, are summoned to the commandant of the, this traveling camp. They travel the summoned to his tent, and they're pretty worried about this. You know, they don't know what's going to go on, and they walk into the tent, and there is a, a table with Shabbos candles, and. Uh, and the commandant's wife and their child, who he has with him. And uh, he says, we understand there were Jewish women here. We want to make Shabbos with you, and tomorrow you'll be free. Wow. And so uh, they're, they're, uh, they're released, and they go into the town of Kovel. And my mother, uh, my mother seeks some, uh, some work there. She ends up working in a hospital for German, uh, Soviet hospital for German prisoners of war. And she's wandering, you know, with the women. And uh, uh, one day when she's walking around, she uh, she's uh, she meets another young man. And this man is Shimon Rosen Rosenbaum. So my name, Russick, is a accident of immigration, a story for another day. Uh, but um, so Shimon Rosenbaum and my mother uh, start um, dating. And uh, before you know it, my mother and uh and uh, my uh father shimon and all of those women who i said who had survived the war right they also met women they also met men in kovel and they were all married together under the same chuppah no kidding that's yeah. an amazing story so and, they came to the they came to the united states when uh so uh, uh my parents uh left with the bricha from kovel they went into czechoslovak to uh to po West, uh, Western Poland, then they went to Czechoslovakia, and they end up in a DP camp in, uh, in Austria. And my, uh, my uncle, my great uncle, Herman Yablokov, 
uh, he uh, finds my mother there because he's touring the DP camps and entertaining Jews. And before he gets started with that, he comes and sees my mother, who's pregnant with my brother. And uh, th I have a photograph of that reunion, which you saw in, my in that video. And so uh, they, uh, he gets them out of Austria, sets them up in some housekeeping in Stuttgart, Germany. And then it takes from uh, that uh, from 1947 until 1949 for them to come to the U.S. They come to the U.S. and then they uh, through, Ellis, they, through Ellis Island. Oh no, no uh, Ellis Island had long been shut down by then. They they just lit. They uh, they arrive at a slip in New Jersey and uh, and uh, you know my uncle being this. Uh, well-known entertainer, so the Yiddish forwards was there. And there's this picture of my uncle holding my brother, which ended up in the Yiddish forwards. And that picture was reprinted in the last print edition of the Yiddish forwards as well, with a little caption I wrote for uh, uh, for Rachel Schachter, who's the editor of the Yiddish forwards. I know Rachel very well. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, they, they, you know, they, 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 come, they come to the US and so, I think the, the thing that typifies their existence in New York is that they really are embedded in a, in a culture of Jewish survivors and other parts of the Jewish community. And uh, my parents were incredibly fortunate. So not all survivors of the Holocaust found family that embraced them. My parents were embraced by my mother's side of the family and um, and my father's side of the family were equally warm. As a matter of fact, my, my father had a whole group of women who were first cousins and, some, and, uh, and, some, and a couple of men. All of those women became my mother's sisters. Hmm. Uh, it's, uh, it was a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So you know, we were, we were close, close with that whole family that whole time. So oh. tell me the pecking order. You are the youngest. Yeah, I'm the youngest. My brother Michael, uh, who was born Muttel, was born in. Um, uh, he was born in um, in Linz, uh, Wegscheid, Germany. Uh, sorry, Austria. And then uh, my sister was born in uh, in Brooklyn, at a high, uh, hospital on King's Highway, and I was born at a hospital, Caledonia. And, uh, oh, uh, not a Caledonia, a hospital in in Borough Park. So how would you, in a, you know, kind of a succinct way, describe the personality of your mother and the personality of your father? So my, my mother was, uh, you know, very extroverted, very open. She was very heavily engaged with uh, the, the survivor community, uh, took a leadership position in uh, the Grudnik community, uh, you know, all the survivors, and uh, worked with Ort, you know, just very, very much engaged with uh, the, uh, her neighborhood and, and the like. And my dad is, he, you know, he's a, a guy that was a, a craftsman and he loved to go to work and, uh, and provide for his family. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, had a lot of very close friends, but he was a quiet man. Very, much, very, very quiet. What man. were the occupations of your parents? So my mother, uh, my mother was a homemaker and, uh, they eventually bought some real estate and she managed that. And my father was a uh, plumber and mechanical contractor, uh, eventually working in the printing trades of uh, in New York City, uh, installing equipment and the like. So how would you describe for yourself growing up in your mom and dad's home? Uh, I, Challenging, pressure? Uh, fun, well, I, fun? I, well, I think there was a lot of pressure to be to academically excel you know, uh, without a doubt. They, expect, they had high expectations for the children in terms of education. Uh, you know, I think they uh, they they had expectations to for us to behave well, you know, as you can imagine, and uh, and to be respectful uh, and um, and to uh, uh, and to engage in in the broader in the broader community. But I think it's also fair to say that my parents had this distinct notion of being Jewish, not only as a faith. But really, as uh, you know, their Yiddish folk, you say in Yiddish, the Jewish people, you know, Jewish peoplehood, and uh, and Avat Yisrael, you know, love of the Jews. So my, 
you know, my, my father worked with Orthodox Jews. He's, he had many customers that were Hasidim and Haredim in Borough Park in, in New York. And my mother rented uh, in Seagate. There was a seaside community, often rented uh, summer apartments to uh, the Hasidim who would come from Borough Park and from Crown Heights for the summer to Seagate. And so I think there was this expectation that, you know, uh, to be very accepting of the, the full range of Jewish people, wh wh whether or not you're completely secular or you're uh, religious or you're not, you know, it's, 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 it's in, embrace that. And I think I came away with a great sense of that from both of them. So when you uh, are ready to leave the house, you went to what school? What I, went to, uh, I went to undergraduate at Northwestern University. Okay. And then um, let's talk about your leaving the house. What did your mother give you advice and your father giving you advice when you left their uh, nest? Uh, well, uh, I think it, it was more along the lines of it was a reluctant departure on their part. So uh, my brother had gone to school in, um, in Brooklyn uh, and then upstate New York and then in the city. And my sister had gone to school on Long Island. And my parents' notion of my going to Chicago uh, was just insane to them. Why, why are you going so far away? We'll never see you. And uh, it, it, if it wasn't for my sister and my brother who really encouraged my parents to let me go, you know, having gotten some dollars from Northwestern to make it feasible, I don't think they would have let me. So it was a very reluctant thing for them to, to let me go. I was, you know, I was their baby in the family. So well, you, um, went to, you went to Northwestern, and, you, and then you said you have a PhD. What is your PhD in? Uh, and where my PhD is in chemical engineering, and I got that at UC Berkeley many years later. Okay, and where are you working now? I work at Astronautics Corporation of America, where I'm the chief scientist. Okay, well, that's very exciting, and yeah. wait, congratulations on your achievement. Thank you. So you're, you're out in the world. When did you meet Myra, and we share the same wife's name. Of yeah, we do. I ask you, how many years are you married? Uh, we are going on 38. We just today are celebrating. Today is the 6th uh, of the 8th of, of June, and we're just celebrating our 36th anniversary. Did you know awesome. your wife? Awesome. How many awesome. years did you know your wife before you got married? Uh, uh, about two. Okay. Well, I have I have six years before because we were in business together. So uh, I, I often will say I have a solid uh, thirty six with a soft forty two. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's yeah. a great way. And we shared the city of Allentown. So what got you to Allentown? Yeah. So uh, I after graduating from undergraduate, I went to work for Air Products and Chemicals. Okay. Uh, in Allentown, which is and, one of the largest, for those who don't know, that's one yeah. of the largest industry giants in the Allentown Lehigh Valley area, and they're very even till today, they're they're still huge. Yes, uh, so I I came to work there, and um, uh, you know I I I began, uh, you know I began looking, uh, getting to know people in the community, and. Uh, I would say most of the women that I was dating, none of them were Jewish, okay? And I eventually, uh, a friend of mine, Mike Wax, who also went to Northwestern with me, he, would, uh, he, had, come to North, he had come to Air Products a couple of years before me. He was active in, uh, in the young singles group, Jewish singles group in the Lehigh Valley. And so I, uh, and I, I was traveling a lot and I didn't really get a chance to connect with those folks as often. And I walked into his office one day and I'm in my, uh, I'm in my, uh, uh, my, uh, my jeans and t-shirt cause I've been working in the field which is a little odd in a very, in a very stringent corporate culture where people were still wearing suits. Of course it's the eighties. And I walk into his office and I tell him your job in the next couple of weeks is to find me a nice Jewish woman. <laughs> and so, so uh, you found her in the Jewish singles group. So what year? Yep. What year? What year was this? This is uh, this is this this is December of uh, December of eighty one. Well, that's very interesting because I met Myra in the Jewish singles group in in nineteen eighty one as well. There you go. So I don't know if you knew Myra from the Jewish singles group. I, I believe we, ra I think we ran into her, but I think we knew her, uh, we had more, more interaction with her when, uh, uh, when she was working at um, uh, Congregation Beth Israel. Bethel. 
Bethel, sorry. Bethel, yeah. Bethel. So let's come back. You're yeah. now, uh, you, you now met Myra. When did you get married? Uh, we got married in uh, August of 84. Okay. And you are now where? In Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. And so you've now, why don't you tell the audience how many children you have? Oh, we have. I, how we old have two, are now? Yeah, we have two children, uh, Natanya, who's uh, 30, and Zoe, who's 28. And they're uh, they're both with their uh, they're both with their partners. They've they've had civil weddings, and this year we're doing uh, finally we're getting out of COVID, and we're going to uh, we're having two Jewish weddings this year. Very oh, nice in August and October, and we're very excited. Oh, and they've met some some great men, uh, Alex and Adam, and so we're very happy for them. And you know, and where do they live? Uh, Zoe uh, Zoe lives in Chicago with Adam and Natanya. And Alex live in uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Nice. So let me ask. Um, okay, the idea of um, bringing up your family. Do you have you seen in the growth of your children before they you know left the nest that you brought things from your parents to them? And what exactly can you kind of pinpoint from your parents that you can identify in your children? Yeah. So my uh my both my both my children both my daughters were very close to my my mother and my father Dora and when, can you just time um I, a bless they're a blessed memory correct yes yeah blessed and when memory. did they when did they pass oh uh, more than a decade ago okay and so, so go ahead you were saying yeah so they were they were very they were very close to them um uh my you know when when they got old enough when they hit around 12 13 14 depending on, on that when my parents were living in florida and they would uh they would be like uh yearly yiskorum the yisker for the uh for the martyrs of the grudno and bialish stucker ghetto uh i would take you know when each one of them got to be 12 or 13 i take them to that event you know and and they would either write a poem or they'd say something and you know, they get a chance to meet the survivors because I thought it was really important for them to have this, you know, this memory of of having met the these people who went through this experience. And, uh, you know, I I and all, and both of them uh, had are very well connected to their Judaism. You know, uh, my uh, my older daughter, Natanya, was a. Uh, uh, was a, a her minor was in Jewish studies and uh, and Zoe uh, uh, Zoe had had a lot of uh, spent a lot of time at um, at uh, Chabad when she was uh, in uh, at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison and you know really uh, I think they're steeped in Jewish culture. I think they got that at home and they got that from their grandparents on both sides of the family. Myra's, Myra's parents were very, uh, very much into that as well. So when you married uh, Myra and you, and you have a long relationship, if Myra was sitting next to you, how would she answer the following question? How is it living with a second generation? It uh, can be challenging at times. And which way? Well, I, you know, uh, I, I came away of my, of my, uh, between myself, my brother, and my sister, I'm the one that sort of came away with this notion of keeping the memory of of my my parents' wartime experience alive. I'm the I'm the uh, uh, the, the genealogist historian. of the family, you and know, the and, the, like, and it sounds like the historian as well. Uh, yes, a historian of the family, and uh, I would say one of my hobbies is Eastern European Jewish history as well. So. You know, I, I you know I, I think sometimes my kids think it's a bit of an obsession, uh, and maybe uh, maybe that's a fair characterization. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I think uh, I I I'd like to believe that um, they got the best of it, and uh, I think I can't tell you whether or not they were traumatized by that. You'd have to ask them. But I think they were deeply affected by it. There's no doubt. With your mom and your dad, do you? <laughs> Were they able to um, share the Holocaust at the appropriate age with your with your with your daughters? 
my mother, my mother, yes, very much so. And the older they got, the more so. Um, uh, I think that uh, when when my father passed away, my mother came to live in Milwaukee, uh, not far from us. And so my brother lives in the same in Milwaukee as well. And so my mother was, uh, you know, only a ten minute drive from uh, either my brother or myself. And my my kids went there. They spent a lot of time, and they heard. Uh, I think at this point they're like in their later teens, yeah, and they're and they're. I think my parents are. are my mother's sharing. Uh... Oh, you froze. Sorry. Okay. So you were telling us a little bit about how your mother was sharing the Holocaust with your daughters. Yeah. So my my mom my mom. Uh, shared the her holocaust story with my my kids and my mom was writing her memoirs with two other women uh while she was here in milwaukee so i think a lot of the stories were sort of fresh again and uh, you know uh, i i think she was always very cognizant my mother was you know until her alzheimer's got really bad she was very cognizant of of trying to stay reasonably appropriate around those issues. Because I don't think she was, she wasn't looking to frighten them. I think she was just looking to share that. And I also think she also tended to spend time talking about maybe more positive experiences, not, not, not horrific ones. So part of the, part of what I've learned from doing so many programs and speaking to so many people is for instance, I disclosed to you that I had um, trauma that uh, was inherited from being a survivor's son, though I had never had my parents speak to me about um, the trauma. And I would, when my businesses were, as I was a startup guy, my business would go somewhat tip south. I would invariably have the same nightmare, which is Nazis interrogating me yeah. under a hot, bright light. And I would yeah. wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat that I have to take a shower. And now, in the prior episode, you talk a little bit, you talked a little bit about some trauma that you've experienced. As you grew up and as you went to work, do you have any uh, trauma? And I think our audience really learns that there, you know, what I've heard time and time again, as well as it helped and it was healing for me is that I'm not alone. I thought that all of these uh, nightmares that I was having, I was going crazy and I was alone. So part of the sort of lifting of the the gorilla off my shoulders is yes. to be able to realize that you're not alone so do you have any way of connecting with this topic or you mentioned why don't you may, maybe re-mention the story that you told and maybe you can take it forward if in fact you've had additional trauma um past so uh help me to recall exactly you, which you talked about you when you were a child you talked about nazis uh, and, and yeah nightmares. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think there, I, I don't, I think there were times when I had, you know, horrible dreams. Uh, I think those happened when I was younger. You know, I, I think um, as the, as time went on and I, uh, I was further and further away from being in my, my parents' household, uh, that, uh the nature of those dreams went away and um, and my interest in exploring uh, the the Shoah and its history from a sort of a quasi academic perspective and a, and a personal one by talking to my mother, maybe that was sort of a release, you know, so that it uh, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't so deeply embedded, you know, that. Uh, it, it found it found another outlet, and so the the uh, the occasional really horrible dreams that I had of people chasing me or, so or I, the like they went I want, away. So I want to propose something to you. I know you yeah. at the you volunteer at the uh, Milwaukee Holocaust Education Center. Yes. And how long have you been doing that for? And I'm wondering if the fact that you are so immersed yourself into the European history, you know your you know your um, I think you're the first person who can articulate to the level of detail uh, about a story about their parents that I have interviewed so far. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of 
um, background on why you're doing the volunteering, when you started. Okay. Yeah. In fact, this is your outlet to unburden. Yes. Your trauma. Yeah. It's so a, maybe it's just a it's just a you know maybe a skeptical speculation, but I'm wondering if it's part of the. Getting it off your shoulders. Yeah, I, I think Jeff, you're correct. So I, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So um, um, I'm trying to, you know, COVID, COVID creates time dilation, so you get, you lose track of stuff. But I would say, uh, about three or four years ago, um, I, uh, I, uh, well, even going back further than that, maybe six years ago. Uh, I befriended uh, a gentleman by the name of Shai Pilnick, who's now a dear friend of mine. And Shai at the time was the director of the Holocaust Education Resource Center here in Milwaukee. And uh, he, uh, he began engaging me uh, to get involved. And, uh, and then one of the projects that he got started was trying to get uh, children of Shoah survivors to tell their parents stories so that it can be told at schools and universities and community groups. And I embraced that, uh, that challenge. And I, uh, I went to some seminars that he gave along those lines with some others who had, a few others people who had done this. And I started putting my slide deck together. And, uh, and my first slide deck was, it's fair to say it was very academic. I mean, I'm a PhD, you know, I'm a, you know, it's not a surprise. So it was very academic and more historical. And Shai uh, sat me down very kindly. And he said, this is all well and good. Uh, but, you know, first of all, you're, you're actually not a professional historian. So that's one thing. And then the second one is, although you have a great knowledge of this, the story that you're telling won't be lasting in people's minds until you make it personal. So I went back and I uh, started to think about what that is. And I created, I started watching all of my mother's, um, uh, I listened to my mother's audio tapes that she made in the eighties with folks from Yad Vashem. And then I listened to the Spielberg tapes in great detail and started grabbing documents that, I, that she had written or notes that I had taken over the years. And I started to think about how to present the story. And I, I think what Myra, my wife Myra would say to anyone who's listening to this is that it was horrific for me. You know, it was like going down into a pit. You know, there were, there were some times when I'm editing, make, making choices for the editor uh, to clip, make clips so that I could put my stuff together. And I'm listening to pieces of the stories over and over again and of course, I'm trying to pick stories that have great emotional content because I'm trying to leave an impression on my audience. And it, 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 it was literally gut-wrenching. I mean, there are like, there are tears on me. And, and I was also, just prior to that, a couple of years before that, I was the editor of my mother's memoir. I, I mean, I could remember being on business flights where I'm reading the book and the pe I'm thinking the people next to me must think I'm crazy because I'm reading this book and I'm drenched, right? Because it's you're reading it again and again. And, and so I think, there's, I think there's some catharsis that came from that that allowed me to approach, uh, 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 approach the prob the, this subject in a different fashion because you know, it's sort of a little bit like a callus or a scar, right? You know, it's uh, uh, it, the, the place becomes a little bit less tender. And I, I'll say that sometimes I worry that it becomes so, the tenderness is so gone that sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, we saw I'm, that I'm compromising, you know, I'm compromising my mother's memory or my father's memory by it, you know? But we saw that the tenderness isn't gone. Yeah, thank you. It's right. It's right at the tip, and it's beautiful that you, you that you can actually share that with us. Thank you. Jeff. So I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave the interview um, with this question for you. And um, what is left for you and Myra on your bucket list? Well, I think the the bucket list for us is uh, we're we're closing in on retirement, and um, how old are you? 
Uh, I'm 64. Okay. And Myra is an age I won't disclose because I'm now <laughs> out. And um, and uh, you know we're we're hoping that uh, we're planning, I should say, to spend some time with our our daughter and her husband, and hopefully they'll be uh, you know down the road there'll be some grandchildren in uh, in Vancouver. They're both in uh, in residency there as physicians. And so we're looking forward to going there and spending a bunch of time. We've been there once and we'd like to be able to go there frequently. And we'd like to spend some time with, um, you know, more time, quality time with Zoe and Alex and Adam and, um, and see uh, how their life de develops and eventually they'll build a family. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's about spending time with family and, and, uh, and uh, I, I also would like to spend a lot more time uh, visiting Israel, and uh, I have this, uh, I have this thing on my bucket list to eventually, in multiple trips, if certainly not one, to walk the Israel Trail. Mm -hmm. And one of the last things I'll say is, uh, I've been fortunate. I've uh, renewed contacts with uh, the children of the women who survived the Shoah with my mother. Wow! And um, uh, some of those contacts were even strengthened that my daughter Natanya spent a semester in Jerusalem and she spent uh, just about every other Shabbatot with, uh, with uh, Chara Badenstein and her family in, uh, in Israel. And uh, it's, it's nice to see that uh, intergenerational connection. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. And uh, to do that in the, uh, in the Jewish homeland, the Jewish country, Jewish state is a wonderful well, I, thing. I want to say that you don't blow your own horn, but I think you have another group of friends, and that is the friends that you've made at the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center, and the education that you provide in the Milwaukee area, which is which is a mitzvah, Steve. So oh, thank you. I want to uh, I want to blow your horn, and I want to thank you. I want uh, everyone to know that you are uh, really connected to the Holocaust Museum. Yeah. And um, if you give me the okay, I, I would love to be able to publish your email address so people who are uh, reading this or watching this um, can actually connect with you because they may have relationships yeah. to, to the area in Europe or to names that you mentioned. Yeah, so I, uh, what I'll say is that uh, folks are welcome to uh, uh, friend me on Facebook. I, I'm a little bit protective about public disclosure sure. of my email address. Okay. And uh, I will say that uh, I, I, I have a talk I give about my mother. I've given it in a number of places and uh, I'm happy to do it via Zoom or in person as well. I'll keep it. We, I am programming 2023, believe it or not, for the group. And so I think you have a great story to tell and I'm thank going you. through it. I'll be reaching out to you to, to get it scheduled. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. And we're going to... Uh, bring to close the first and second episodes with Steve Russick from Milwaukee for the Obligations of Memory podcast uh, for the Jewish culture and Holocaust remembrance. Thanks so much, Steve, and appreciate your coming on board and telling us your family story. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was a, a wonderful, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to tell this story and, uh, and for your thoughtful questions. Thank you.